Hey guys and gals, Vlad here with AVT Astro. And today, as always, I've got an interesting Astro topic for you guys. For those of you that might not be familiar, I run a little Astro blog called avt-astro.com and of course the YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed, please do consider subscribing. Um, over the years, I've had the privilege of owning over 100 scopes, more accessories than I can count. Now, if you guys have watched my channel, of course, you've heard me say that intro before, um, but you might be surprised to know that all, out of all those scopes that I have owned, I actually have never owned an RC design telescope. So this is the TPO RC6. Um, there's a number of Chinese, or there's a number of companies that use the same you know, scope, essentially the same OPA that, that, that's reprinted, that's made in China. Um, so so anyhow, my main you know thing that I want to kind of cover with this scope is you know as you, as you guys might know if you've watched my channel I'm you know primarily a visual observer I do love to do EAA and I do some astrophotography, uh, but I wanted to give you my you know kind of thoughts from a visual perspective of you know using one of these things. Um, now chances are if you're buying one of these you're probably not buying it for visual unless you just happen to stumble upon it kind of like I did really. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, I did want to kind of give you my thoughts about it, you know, if you're buying one of these to do astrophotography or maybe EAA, um, you know, how is it to actually use one of these things for visual use? Alright, before it gets too dark, let's check this thing out. Uh, so these guys, um, they do include a 2-inch uh, focuser uh, standard with them, it's a 2-speed. So that's pretty neat, they come with extension tubes, there's actually three of them that come with them. I only have one right now for visual, uh, that works just fine with a 2-inch diagonal. Uh, but anyway, depending on what you're using it for, whether it be a camera or visual or whatever, you know, you can add or, you know, subtract those so that you can reach focus. Um, kind of like, you know, a couple of the unique things, you know, about the RC scopes is that, compared to an SCT anyway, is that the, the primary mirror on these things is fixed, right? So it does not go up and down like on an SCT to reach focus. That's why you have to have the external focuser because that's the only way to focus this thing. Um, and that is actually kind of why you need to add and subtract these extension tubes, you know, depending on, you know, what your setup is. Because on um, SCT, the movement of the mirror is pretty long. So you could always reach focus. Um, <clears throat> kind of another distinguishing fa factor with these guys is that they are very, very well baffled, actually. I mean, dude, check out those baffles. And the baffles, if you're not familiar, are these guys right here. Uh, what they do is uh, they prevent light from basically kind of bouncing around the tube and stuff. So it kind of traps it, you know, if it's, you know, happened to be at a weird angle or something like that. You know, this is a pretty inexpensive scope. I'm actually surprised that more scopes aren't as well baffled as this thing is. I mean, for a $500 telescope, which is about what these guys retail for brand new, I mean, these baffles look, so look amazing. The other thing that I really, really like about this, that this, I mean, with the really bright light, it doesn't really show up too well. Very matte paint in here. Very matte to black, I should say, paint in there, which is very good too. Helps with tree light control. Um, otherwise, these are an F9 setup. Uh, focal length on these is about 1300 millimeters. And, um, Kind of like the other distinguishing factor with the RC design is that uh, they are supposed to give you uh, coma-free images and uh, spherical aberration-free images and chromatic aberration-free images. So now, uh, my main goal tonight is to kind of like, you know, test that out for all for visual use. Does it make a difference? Like, is it better than an SCT? Um, I'm not going to lie. Um, I have already had this thing out for the last couple of nights. So I've, you know, kind of done a little bit of observing. Uh, with it, um, so this isn't my first night out there. And actually, let me kill these lights. I've got the moon in there. Let's see. Let's see if we could take a peek at the moon real quick. Oh yeah, there it is. Now, obviously, I mean for purely visual use, I mean eyepiece projection like this. It's about the only way that I can kind of show you a live view. And uh, you see that black dot in the middle? That's kind of curious. That's the secondary shadow. So that's basically, you're actually, now visually you usually don't really see that, but that's, you know, it does have a pretty big secondary mirror, so that's, you're actually seeing the shadow from this. Um, again, while it's still kind of bright enough, I will kind of point this out. 
the this one of the other distinguishing factors of the rc design is that it does have these veins right that kind of hold the secondary mirror because on an sct the secondary is held by the corrector plate by the glass plate that's in the front here and there's nothing that's you know protruding into the life light path besides the secondary here you do have these veins um and uh, I'll kind of touch on that later, uh, but these do introduce basically diffraction spikes. So when you're looking at a star, you'll basically kind of see like four little spikes, you know, kind of coming out of there. So anyway, I might do a little bit of a shooting of, you know, me observing with this then uh, for your entertainment purposes. But um, after that, we'll kind of conclude, uh, you know, what I think about the scope inside. See you guys in a bit. satellite up above i think that's the international space station actually Alrighty. anyway guys it's nighttime so you know my main curiosity with testing out this telescope uh for visual use is that they claim uh, that it's supposed to be coma free now if you're not familiar with what coma is it basically makes stars uh look kind of more like comets versus uh uh ten points um, and typically, the um, wider uh, the view, field of views of the eyepiece, the more drastic that effect is. So, in order to test them, for your consideration, I've got a wide range of eyepieces here. So, starting with about 50 degrees, we have the Meat Super Plus 26 millimeter, very, very common eyepiece. Next up in the 60 degree field of view, we have none other but the Teleview Panoptic 24 millimeter, uh, representing the 82 degree field of view eyepiece. This is the Celestron Axiom XL. Wide range of uh, brands, right? So that way you guys don't think that I'm some kind of fanboy trying to promote something, because <laughs> I'm not. Uh, but in any case. Um, I didn't uh, have a 100 uh, degree field of view eyepiece out because, you know, they're pretty pricey, pretty heavy, and who'd use like an $800 eyepiece with a $500 scope? Then I got to thinking, you know, why the heck not? So I've got the Explore Scientific 25 millimeter, 100 degree out as well. So we'll give that a whirl. Alrighty guys, welcome back inside. So I had a pretty good time observing with the RC6 last night. Um, I did get a chance to try out all of the eyepieces that I um, mentioned and I'll kind of start with the really good. Let's get that out of the way. Um, uh, chromatic aberration wise secondary color it's a reflecting telescope they kind of advertise as not having that and pretty much no reflecting telescope is going to have that chromatic aberration is actually made by lenses so since this thing doesn't use any lenses i wouldn't expect to have it and i did not see anything i mean i had vega um which is a very bright blue star uh, up to pretty high powers there was no chromatic aberration so that was really nice uh, spherical aberration, they kind of talk about that with the RC design. Um, really, that's kind of hard to judge. That's really more of a high power thing to where, uh, you know, you'd want to have like planets or something like that, a high power, which really isn't what the scope's made for anyway. But anyway, uh, that basically determines if uh, the optics can converge all the light together and not kind of just like, you know, have it uh, meet like at random points, but actually meet at one point. Uh, optics on it do look pretty sharp, so... I'll give it that for a $500 scope. I'd say, you know, the spherical aberrations controlled pretty well with it. And lastly, coma. So that's what I was kind of testing with, um, you know, uh, the progressively wider eyepieces. So basically coma, um, essentially, usually the bigger the sensor they use for astrophotography or the wider field of view eyepiece they use for visual, you'll start to see more and more coma. And that's just like, again, stars look, look starting to look kind of like comets, especially, you know, the further that you get out into the field of view um, instead of a pinpoint of light. Now I will be, I will say I was really surprised. The scope is an F9, so it's not really fast. And typically, you know, slower scopes suffer less from coma. Uh, but at F9, I was able to go up, you know, from the 50 degree to the 68 to the 82 to even the 100 degree field of view eyepiece. 
And Como is very well controlled. I mean, really everything looked very flat across the field of view. Uh, so with, you know, I'd say almost no coma, even in the 100 degree uh, IPS, which is very nice. So I'd say that the marketing, you know, claims of the Ritchie uh, design is, you know, kind of warranted. Now, having gotten, you know, kind of through all of that, um, what are some of the things that I kind of did not like about the scope? Well, as I mentioned uh, kind of at the beginning of the video, last night wasn't the first time that I had the scope out, right? Um, I have heard that these things are kind of difficult to collimate. Uh, they're hard to collimate. And I wouldn't say it's hard, I'd say it's kind of tedious. Uh, you definitely need, you know, some kind of collimation tool. You know, I won't really get into that, but basically, there's essentially three, you know, adjustments that you need to make. You need to um, align the focuser to the tube. You need to align the uh, tilt of the primary mirror, and then you also need to align the second, the tilt of the secondary mirror. Now, all of this is kind of in their length, right? That's why it's tedious because, you know, when you adjust one, another one gets kind of out of whack and you kind of have to keep on, you know, doing it until it's perfectly aligned. Um, the one thing that I will say though, is that these scopes from the factory, they do not come with a way to uh, adjust the tilt of the focuser, right? You actually have to buy like another accessory to, to be able to do that. So I think that's a, that's a downside. Um, I don't know why they don't come with that. I mean, it's, you know, it shouldn't, it's really not that expensive an accessory. So I think they should really come with that. But um, yeah, collimation on these, uh, again, I don't find it hard. I, I just find it tedious, you know, and time consuming. Uh, and I will say that it's much harder though than on like on an SCT and a refractor usually doesn't need collimation. A daub is much faster to collimate than one of these guys. The other thing that I will say, um, you know, and this is kind of a personal preference, but these spider veins, right? Um, you know, an SCT doesn't have them again. Um, they are fairly thick, right? So what ends up happening, I'm posting the image now that I just took, you know, of, uh, with eyepiece projection, you know, last night with the scope, is that you'll actually get kind of like four flares from very bright stars. And you can see this visually as well. Uh, so, um, you know, some people, they don't really get bothered by that. Like, honestly, I'm not used to seeing that uh, from a telescope, so it kind of does bother me, I guess, in a way. Although I will say that it only happens on very bright stars, like dimmer stuff, you know, it's, um, it's really not a bother. All right, so overall, um, just to kind of sum it up, uh, I found the contrast to be pretty good on this scope. Um, it does have a fairly large you know, central obstruction, so that does kind of drop the contrast, but I feel like it is made up by the excellent baffling system on it. Um, you know, I was actually, I was looking at, uh, you know, when I was checking out all the different views with the eyepieces, I was looking at M13 for a while with the scope, and um, I found the view to be, you know, pretty enjoyable. I live under a kind of a dark sky site, you know, fairly dark out here, although the, I think about the quarter moon was out already. But anyhow, view was pretty nice. Now, I will give you guys this. Um, after I was done, you know, kind of playing around with this guy, um, I was ready to switch to one of my normal scopes, which is a Takahashi FS-102, it's a four-inch Apple doubler, right? And um, pretty much anything that I looked at with this, including M13, um, but also special like double stars and that type of deal, we're just much better in contrast. Uh, M13, like the stars in it stood up much better in the Apo. Um, so, you know, take it for what it is. I mean, this I think is a you know, fairly good uh, visual scope if you already own it um, for astrophotography and you want to use it for visually. Um, is it like, you know, anything special? Um, honestly, I would say no, not really. So even though I didn't find the views in this like, you know, to like blow my socks away or anything like that, and I didn't really expect them to, uh, but it does provide some very nice views. So yeah, put an eyepiece in there and check some stuff out. Anyhow, if you guys have any questions, comments, or anything like that, I'll leave them in the thing below. If you're not subscribed, again, please do consider subscribing, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.